Thank you so much, President Minnis, or as I will forever really think of him from now on, P. Minnie, I'm sorry. <laughs> And the members of the Board of Directors, thank you too to the leaders of the sponsoring institutions, Prioress Ann Shepard, Abbot James Albers. This is a lovely honor and I'm really blessed and encouraged to receive it, especially from a college consecrated to Our Lady and so energetically accomplished in the ways of marrying faith and reason. Congratulations too to Dr. Camerata today. I'm frankly really humbled by his gifts and how he uses them for others. I'm also humbled by the fact that he apparently doesn't sleep at all. I, I thought I slept a little. Um, this has been such an enjoyable weekend here at Benedictine uh, with many students and administrators who clearly love this place. Also to see my friend Archbishop Nauman. I've known him since he was Father Joe uh, in St. Louis. He too clearly loves this college and you. So my first order of business with my newly minted status here is to offer you and your family and friends uh, and your loved ones and your professors and the administrators who make this community so beautiful, my very sincere congratulations. School is awesome. I, apparently I have never left. I've only not been either in school or teaching for 13 years and I'm 53, so clearly I really love school. Uh, I, for analysis, for critical writing, for scholarship, not to mention sheer grit and a hefty tolerance for not sleeping, all of which you have acquired. This is awesome, but so too is being done, at least for the time being, and ready to move on to the next challenge in your life. Though I imagine it won't be terribly easy for you to leave this beautiful community on the hill. So my congratulations to you and all the people who have helped bring you to this point. As I reflect upon what your college regards as my accomplishments which bring me here today, there's a part of me, and it's not a small part, which regards my so-called accomplishments as really nothing at all, or even as potentially dangerous. I can talk, I can write. What are these on the scale of human needs? They're more often an invitation to pointless pride especially relative to the depth of human need today. But there's another part of me that gets that words can matter, but only with this indispensable caveat. They only matter to the extent that they are put in the service of human beings in need. And I imagine that it's at this point when the Holy Spirit enters in and makes more of them than they are themselves. So that's what I want to speak to you about today. So those of us who are much older than you know how long it took us to really intuit and to really try to live by the lesson that it's not all about me and to grasp the difference that it made in our lives and the lives of others. So if I can help you move one inch faster or further toward that realization, then I will observe you this morning. So let me begin by telling you about two weeks ago I was in Rome hanging out with this man who works with the press on behalf of Pope Francis. He is not a naive or inexperienced guy. He's covered some of the hot spots in the world for the leading press outlets. Telling me about something the Pope said to one of the many, many pilgrims crowding St. Peter's Square, he got choked up. It turns out as the Pope was going by, this one pilgrim calls out to him in Italian, Sei l'unico, you are one of a kind. And the Pope stops, and he turns around and says very firmly to the man, but you, you too, you're one of a kind, with great energy. Do you believe it, this reporter says to me? This Pope can bring a tear to my eye. He can choke me up. Imagine what food for thought Pope Francis gave this pilgrim about things like that man's place in God's universe, his, his dignity, his radical equality with every other person on the planet and about the equality and dignity of every other human being he would go on to meet. Imagine how that man will repeat that story for the rest of his life and what his listeners will learn. Pope Francis is a model of how to put words and gestures at the service of other people. He's the living embodiment of that gorgeous command that Pope Benedict gave us, if you remember, in Deus Caritas Est, God is Love. At one point, he says, am I asking you to love every person? And he says, yes. You must give every person you encounter that look of love they crave. 
Now, in my 30 years of working for the church, I can't believe this is where I am, but I have been converted to the central importance of this, taking the time to look at the people you really encounter, to listen, to acknowledge the difficulties they share, often to tell them about your own weaknesses as a fellow pilgrim on the road, whether you're struggling to come to terms with some tough circumstances in your own life or struggling to come to terms with something the church is teaching. Years ago, I spoke openly to several audiences about my difficulties overcoming my selfishness and my careerism to welcome more children into my life. I wrote about it, I spoke about it in my book. Over the last several months, several women have approached me to introduce me to the children they tell me that they welcomed into their lives after they listened to those words. This is Anne, this is John, thank you. I mean, I can't even tell you how I cried to see how beautiful that words could matter. The Holy Spirit must have been with them in that conversation. I've also learned the crucial importance of tone and body language as part of that giving everybody the look of love they crave thing. It's fair to describe my posture during my earliest time on television. I did television weekly for 10 years. I was a crouching tiger. <laughs> One congressman used to tell people about me and he'd say, Helen isn't afraid of man nor beast. Now that's funny and sure, it's good not to be afraid. We don't, we don't have to be afraid when we're prepared to go out there. But it's neither Christian nor very attractive about Christianity to have your conversation partners get the impression that you're sharpening your fangs between remarks. So after gaining more maturity and spending my time in prayer, I came to see my debate partners as children of God, like myself, and to seek to attract them to that love. With warm greetings and goodbyes, I hug pretty much everybody. I have to stop myself with the students, right? Because that's not cool, right? <laughs> not when you don't know them, especially. Um, with calm, with reasoned arguments, never to exaggerate, of course, never to name call. I saw the fruits of this just um, within the past year. I was at the airport taking my son out of the country to a talk I was doing, and I bumped into one of the, the biggest leaders in the abortion rights movement all through the 1990s. Uh, we were able to hug one another and ask about each other's children. I remember learning when I used to debate her how she had undergone an abortion when her husband was abandoning her and their three children they had together. I tried to keep her pain in mind when we debated, even as I did contradict her facts. Pope Francis' recent remarks to the Secretary of the United Nations confirm the truth that whatever are your talents, as diverse as they are here, you have only to put them to the service of others in need to find your way to God, to happiness. And he said this, today in concrete terms, there is an awareness of the dignity of each of our brothers and sisters whose life is sacred from conception to natural death. This must lead us to share with complete freedom the goods which God's providence has placed in our hands. Material, yes, but also spiritual and intellectual. Referencing the story of Jesus' encounter with Zacchaeus, the tax collector, he said, Jesus doesn't ask Zacchaeus to change jobs, nor does he condemn his activity. He simply asks him to put everything freely, yet immediately and indisputably at the service of others. One final thought then on this matter of giving as receiving or this whole giving every person that look of love they crave thing. You're likely aware that some of the beliefs and teachings of the Catholic Church previously taught globally and even in the public square by secular folks until it feels like about five minutes ago, but they are under today enormous pressure, in particular about our teachings on respect for life, for women, for marriage, and for religious freedom. In my view, we've reached the point where arguments for religious freedom are often experienced by listeners as some kind of special pleading by a narrow interest group. Of course, we know that these things we're asking for are nothing of the kind. They're a call to respect all human beings' right to look for ultimate truth and then to live in accordance with truth when they find it. Of course, respecting due limits, respecting public peace. But I think 
we're most persuasive on our religious freedom argument when they are, we are manifestly the kind of people, the kind of religious community whose ideas and behaviors are clearly what society knows it wants more of and that it desperately needs. So when we demonstrate real solidarity with other humans, compassion for the suffering, an option for the poor, a search for the truth, when our marriages provide the children and the world what St. Paul asks for, a glimpse of God's relationship with people, when, as Pope Francis says, we've got dirt on our shoes because we've been busy going to the outskirts to take care of people, when our church is manifestly a field hospital for all, then when we assert our arguments on religious freedom, they are immeasurably strengthened. Instead of simply demanding our bare statutory and constitutional rights, we should never shirk from talking about what our religious freedom is for. And it's never just for us. It's always for everybody. So with that, I say thank you for listening to me. I hope I've been of service to you. Congratulations on your beautiful accomplishments. Thank you.